Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here. Welcome to the Daily Evolver and This Week in the News. This week, Encore Delight and I take a look at the future of work, starting with the writer's strike in Hollywood. There's and there's a number of dynamics here I think we can get into. The the kind of the most obvious one is it's like kind of the labor capital dynamic of no. these of these writers that are highly unionized and highly kind of effective at working together. And they're like, hey, we haven't had any increase in pay in the last X years. Meanwhile, TV is just off the charts these days with like network Netflix and streaming and all that. Like what what gives? You know, so there's this asymmetric distribution of gains that they're complaining about. And there's this other level for me of, oh wow, this is um this is a union in a non traditional space. This is a white collar union. And so there's a whole a union around creativity. So there's like a whole interesting dynamic there that I think we could get into. But in these articles, there's this little footnote to, oh, and also in the contract, they wanted to talk about AI. Mm -hmm. And they had these concerns, legal concerns, and I think just existential concerns around what their work is going to be like in the future with them um, now that people realize what's going on with AI. And so I think that's that to me gets something that's close to my heart, which is the future of work directly tied into the future of human potential. And there's one quote I'd like to start us with, and then maybe I'll just, we can go from there or I can, I'd love to attack this quote. So there's this guy, Javier Grillo Marxauch, I'm sure if I got that name right, who's a writer and producer for Lost and Dark Crystal, Age of Renaissance, which I guess are TV shows. And he says, artists look at everything ever created and find a flash of newness. What the machine is doing is recombining. Yeah. So he's trying to draw a fundamental distinction between what machine learning and artificial intelligence can do and the creative mind of the artist, which I think is just deeply flawed. Like, I think he's totally wrong. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Why would you, why, what do you find wrong with that? So, so, okay, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in these types of neural networks, but I did study computer science and I have built models like this, not, not at that level of complexity. But my understanding is that there's, there's not, and, and this gets into like questions of divinity, right? But I don't think there's a qualitative difference between what's going on with these models and what's going on in this model in the brain right here. Mm -hmm. There's levels of complexity, but just, just this claim that artists are finding something new where the machine is just recombining. I'm an artist. I've written books. I have a podcast. I do videos. I like all this stuff. I, I don't think that even in my highest moments of inspiration, which I've had in many different media, something fundamentally new is coming in in that way. It's just like, I have all of this data from everything that I've read, every conversation I've had, all of my sensations. You know, I have access to all different types of wisdom, you know, some under the guise of the subconscious, you might call it the divine or my ancestors, but they're all th stimula that I've encountered in this life, to the best of my knowledge. And I'm, I'm combining those in different ways and coming out with Different, different results of that. And the, and the most, the, the best stories, this is like the, the Joseph Campbell insight, the best stories are always the same. And there's, of course, a new skin on it or new flavor and new newness. But I'm, I'm just doing what the machine is doing. And so far, people like me and people much better than me are doing it better than most of the programs. But that's just like, for me, that's just a function of the computational complexity of the brain versus what we've been managing yeah. to build. And if that hasn't already changed, it seems like that will change soon. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, I think you're speaking for a whole lot of people. Uh, and I, I would differ. And I'll, I'll, uh, we could, I'll put my two cents in here and uh, the audience can decide where, what they think. Um, I do think there's a qualitative difference between consciousness of a human being or really any living thing uh, that is different than 
of what machines can do. And I think a, a quick explanation of that would be meditation itself. So would a machine, were, would artificial intelligence meditate? I mean, would, would, would there be a, so when, when humans meditate, we basically look at our minds, but who's looking? And that is the difference. I mean, I think that there is, and, and that humanity and life itself is plugged into a consciousness that existed with the Big Bang. Consciousness came into being as well as matter. And it has complexified. Uh, and that if we look at the whole on theory of, and this is an integral theory, that subatomic particles have prehension. They have a, they have a consciousness, little tiny one, just like they are. Uh, but it's there. And it complexifies into amoebas, you know, that have a consciousness. They can choose. They, they actually can in, uh, choose new things. There's, there's, a, there's a moment of novelty. This is Alfred North Whitehead. There's a moment of novelty built into every moment. There's a possibility of novelty that is part of this, um, you know, consciousness of the cosmos, if you will, that we're plugged into and that we are expressions of, we are transmitters of. Mm -hmm. I don't think that is a function of complexity itself. Um, the, Sam Harris does. He talks about so, what you just said, okay, which is I, that- I, I got to interrupt you. Okay. If you're going to throw me in the same box as Sam Harris, I got to stop that. Well, in this you. case, you know, that, that righteousness <laughs> is some great independent. Any no, no, could no, no, accommodate what I'm saying, but... will be conscious. Yeah. No, anyway. like I, I totally, I, I think I agree to the extent I understand what you said. I think I agree with it. Like, like, I mean, I'm not claiming that the machines can or will have the same consciousness we do. Now, yeah. I see a qualitative difference there at the, at the moment, and I may be proved wrong. You know, I don't know. I'm just talking about artistic production mm -hmm. and, and the, the idea that a sufficiently, like a machine with a sufficiently large data set would not be able to produce really art that is really beautiful and intriguing for humans. And that's, yeah. the, um, that's what I think this, this gentleman has, has wrong. And that, that, and to me, that, that really works into like the existential question of like, well, if I'm paid to do art, WTF? Well, a couple things there, yeah. Uh, and and uh, to, to go back to the writer's strike, they, one of their demands is that AI can't be creating scripts or rewriting parts of their scripts, right? Um, and I think that's probably appropriate. And I, I, I hope they win on that. Um, and, but it's, you know, it's, it gets back to the Turing test. Can AI create a ne Netflix series that is, that viewers would find indistinguishable so created by AI that they would find indistinguishable from one created by human beings. And I'm not so sure, you know, honestly, you know, I think that the, the AI could pass the Turing test. It does in all kinds of ways now with graphics and so forth. And, oh, you yeah. know, you know that I, I did a poem that uh, AI wrote about uh, integral theory that was, you know, beautiful. But here's the rub, Encore, I think. Human beings are going to continue to gain new capacity uh, because that's what evolution does. And we can see the trajectory of that and it continues to happen. Perhaps one of the capacities we will uh, adopt, you know, or, or, or it will emerge, is the capacity to know whether or not something was created by AI. There will be some X factor where we can actually have a we space or we can have some sort of transmissive touch with the artist, which is what we've always assumed we have because it's always all art's always been created by humans. But now, will there be some emptiness at the core of, of something that, that we'll be able to, we can't really tell now, but we will. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, it's, I think it's possible. I, you know, and, and to me, our 
shared experience of emotion is going to be at the core of that. Like the fact that when I read, I just read a book by my friend, Nico Slate. If anybody, it's a book about his brother and it's just called Brothers, just came out. It's just, this book deserves to be on the top of whatever best-selling lists are out there and made into a movie. It's just so beautiful. And as an only child, I really like, I felt like I got what having a brother is about through this incredibly tragic story that he's telling about the loss of his brother. And it's, um, you know, it's something like he knew the latent emotional potential within me and was able to draw it out in ways that I didn't know was possible. And so I don't, I don't think that AI now is able to understand the emotion in the same way because it can only understand it through textual analysis or video analysis you know it's not I, and i don't know i'm not making any claims about what it can yeah. and can't do in the future because oh yeah I, I don't know so i think if there is if there is something like that it's going to come from from emotion yeah. but 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 jeff i've been really and j- just because i you know i'm a computer scientist doesn't that's not like where i'm coming from i'm also kind of a luddite and i'm not into all this stuff in general but last year did you see that thing with lambda there's an uh, interview, this guy, yeah. Greg Lemoine, he's a, he's a, he's a pretty interesting dude. I think he's a spiritual dude. Maybe he's a chaplain and he was a Buddhist monk for a while. Maybe he was a Christian priest, something like that. Also a computer scientist interviewed this chat bot, kind of like GPT style chat bot called Lambda at Google and was really dismayed at the results. I think some computer scientist called him and was like, was like, Hey, we, this thing is claiming to be conscious. Can we interview it? Because if it's a conscious, we got issues here. Right. And so he interviews it and he can't, he can't tell. And they didn't want him to release the transcripts, but he did. And so I heard this podcast of somebody reading the transcript and this chatbot is talking about Les Miserables, the, the novel, and giving its own understanding of what's happening in this novel. But what it's saying is a metaphor for its own condition of being like enslaved in this larger system and i was like you know i you know the turing test study that in college and all that mm-hmm. and i was like oh yeah winter machine is gonna pass the turing test this thing was so far beyond it's like nobody i know could have reflections that deep about les miserables it was so it was it just broke all of my intuitions as to where we are with ai and i was like oh my god this wow. is um it's it's uh wow no, I mean, it really, it, it broke everything that I thought. And I was like, oh, okay. Now I clearly cannot trust my intuitions about AI because I was so wrong about this. And so that's yeah. why when people make claims about it's never going to do X, I'm like, whoa, I mean, it's already done a lot of X. Huh. So. Yeah. But well, let's, let's just say for the moment, I want to take this back to the writer strike and the future yes. of work. Let's just say that I'm right. And this guy is totally wrong. And the way that humans need to differentiate themselves from these machines and find work and find meaning, it can't be the way we've been doing it so far. Right. Then we get to what you said, which is that we're growing in capacity. And the the way to find our, both our livelihood, which I I must come from some form of basic income, you know, (laughs) but that's a different conversation. And our sense of like meaning and satisfaction and being plugged into contribution to the whole is going to come from using faculties that we're really underusing right now. Yeah. I know. How, how great is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, totally. It's just like the faculties that when we move from agricultural to modern, you know, a whole world of abstraction and paper and ink and uh, thinking and planning and ideas. Uh, it's just a completely different human being. You know, not just the t- technological and the exteriors, but the way people think. And, and so the next human being is going to be something uh, even better in a sense. And uh, from an integral perspective, we also want to bring forth the stuff that's been left behind, you know, like indigenous wisdom. Yes. Like, um, you know, deep community and uh, and things that have been... Th- oh. Modernity rang out of the system. Uh, and, you know, evolutionarily, that was its job and it did it. 
And now we're, we want to move into some integration in, in, where, and I, you know, I, you and I have talked about this before about what's the optimum um, pressure to get off the couch so that you really want to get out in the arena and get in the game. And, you know, how does education and how do we even prepare young people for this? And, um, and you, you, you got me thinking about that. And I was thinking that, you know, who doesn't have a prop getting off the couch? It's always rare to get off the couch. A toddler. No. Uh, hunter gatherers didn't have any problem getting off the couch. They had a job to do and they did it. And when it was over, they relaxed, they took a nap. You know, there's that stage of development that we want that, that gets wrung out of the system at traditionalism when you have to sit down and recite the holy books and shut up and conform. That gets suppressed then. From an integral perspective, we want to keep that intact as we continue to add, you know, civilization and rationality and sensitivity of the other stages, but to keep that aliveness. And, you know, I think our grandchildren may have that figured out. I don't know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, for me, it's like, we want all the good things. Yeah. Is that too much to ask? Yeah. All the good things. <laughs> I mean, but then the question, if we take the teaching of like personal responsibility and lack of entitlement, the question is like, all right, if we want all the good things. What are we willing to like, who are we willing to be? Like, what are we willing to give? Yeah. 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 No, totally. And, you know, th there's a lot of, um, with the new generation. And also with the anti-racism and, you know, this, the centering of, of indigenous ways of knowing and so forth, uh, that, you know, and everything is sort of an overcorrection and everybody overdoes their gig, but there's a big fruitful fight being had here that will transform the workplace in, in, into, I don't know what. I mean, we, it's, you know, it would be like asking a farmer to uh, predict modernity. They can't, you know, yeah. so I can't either. But I do know that it'll be, if the trajectory continues, it will include more of what humans are able to do. It will be more humane. I, I think if we just look at the, the you know, the, what green or postmodern worldview is bringing into the system, more egalitarian, more... Um, world-centric, sustainable, environmentally conscious. Um, and, you know, I, and of course, what we want to um, avoid, which is also a gift of post-paternity, if you will, is hopelessness, nihilism, depression, the idea that, you know, the world is a never darkening place. This is where our teenagers are, you know, right now. And um, got that, that we got to get hip to that. Uh, so the people can see, hey, there's a place for me. There is a world for me. I am going to grow up. You know, basic stuff. Uh, and so, I don't know. That's Those will be the pieces that are some of the pieces that uh, that will create the next world. Yeah. And it's, it's a birthday now. now. Yeah. yeah. And it's a bit, I can see it. It's, you know, it's stressful. It's yeah. fun. But it like yes. just imagine that now or close to now, maybe in a year, maybe now, I mean, who knows what's actually going on in these research labs. There's like there's machines that have better dexterity than any surgeon or any athlete. Yeah. And machines that have read, read way more texts than any single person. Yeah. Or maybe even any collection of scholars at a university. And that are capable of like better analysis than any mathematician. Right. Yeah and maybe better visual perception of pixels and color than any artist. And those can all be combined into one creature, right? Or tool. So then in this like Mary Oliver way, what are we going to do with our one beautiful life? Like how, how are we going to contribute? Like we have that in the, in the benevolent scenario that's working for us, right? 
there's all these like other scenarios where that's just it's right. just the end because we're things, working right? for it yeah they're like screw you guys and fine that, that's that's possible i, I think yeah. and but let's just be positive here in the in the in the positive scenario how are we going to like what are we going to do like how are we going to use our like this this magnificent gift of life and joy and connection and consciousness and humor when all of those things can be outsourced yeah well i i'll i'll, I'll give you an answer in the form of an example that comes to mind i was watching the documentary on some indigenous tribe somewhere i forget but the women weren't doing this kind of weaving so the men went out hunting women stayed home they did this weaving and before they started weaving they got all their stuff together they sat in a circle but before there was any work done at all they sang for an hour together that's what people can do that machines are machines aren't going to sit around and sing with each other i don't think there's nothing to there's no we space there's no interiority but we have interiority and we really want to have that liquid louche that con, that liquid connection with each other that we don't even it's hard for us modern people to even put our head around that you know but that's part of what's coming. So there's an example. Oh man. I mean, that's not just an example. That's like, that's inspiring. I want to do that. I want to start every one of my work days and just sing <laughs> with, yeah. with my best friends and my partners. Yes. For an hour. Yes. And then you start working. And 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 but boy, you are a you're a we then. And the we is ontologically different than a group of eyes. It's actually its own thing, you know? So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm glad I'm old because I, I think, you know, I don't, there's some of it I don't want to bother with. <laughs> you know, you can see, I can see the limits of my own evolutionary growth. It's like I've, I've taken enough perspectives already. Thank you very much. Um, uh, but the part of me that wants to just, I'm so curious as to what it'll be. And, um, and, and, and I came across this uh, this idea that I think is really useful when people think about the future, uh, and and I call it the um, Jetsons fallacy. And if so, do you know, know the cartoon show The Jetsons? I remember I watched that yeah. as a kid. Yeah. So The Jetsons is basically a futuristic uh, world where it's push button food and talking robots and flying cars, and yet. George goes to the office every day. He has a domineering boss. Jane, his wife, stays home and you know, she's with the kids. There's no concept there would be anything different in terms of culture. Or consciousness. Fair enough. I mean, that's not what the show's doing. It's a great show. The Flintstones actually do the same thing in, in putting modern sensibilities in the pre-modern world. It's, it's all good artistically, but it's terrible. History yeah. and futurology, you know. Yeah, they're They've different got, people. Like, very advanced technology and like super traditional norms. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's so that's that's one of the things that I have to say when I look at the uh, a lot of the intelligentsia, I think they're they're followed for that fallacy. They they see the future technologies coming on, but there's no growth or, or change in culture and consciousness, and there will be. And it's yeah. fast. It's accelerating. If you look at the acceleration of evolution, it's, I mean, I don't know. It, uh, you know, the singularity is near maybe, but um, it's, 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 it's pretty impressive. Yeah. So there. So there. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, you know, we, we talked about AI and work and I think some good stuff there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good. You know, I mean, we're creating new grooves in the cosmos by having these conversations. These conversations and thinking integral thoughts is an end in itself. And that, you know... I'd say that's one more uh, on the humans are different than machines side of the street, but you know, uh, we'll see how it goes here. We'll put our bets in a time capsule 
and we'll see who wins in five or 500 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fair enough. Later in the week, Ankur and I talked about another strike, the one in France over the retirement age. Okay, so let's let's start today. You know, I've had my father-in-law visiting for the last month. He actually leaves today. And he's he's from he lives in France. He's actually born in Tunisia. And he spent his entire adult life as a dissident. So he was thrown out by the dictator in Tunisia. He went to France. Um, he's been fighting against the dictatorship for there for a long time, was part of the Arab Spring. But as he was in France, he was also, you know, he's just a professional agitator. And so he's been active in human rights causes basically all over the world. And of course, he's really been a big part of these protests recently against uh, Macron's uh, retirement reform, you know, like a work, work reform. This is a, a lot of this information is coming from my wife and my father-in-law who read a lot of news, you know, for what's going on there, but are definitely coming from like a traditional left-wing perspective. So just know that. And... The idea is that they're like, hey, Macron wants to reform the, the, the work system, the pension system. They, from what they see in the analysis they're reading, it's totally not necessary. It's not like the system is going bankrupt. It's more like some kind of ideological commitment he has to work or trickle down economics or something like that. And the way he's done it is to be like, hey, we want to we wanna reduce the age of retirement or increase it rather. We go from 62 to 64, and it's been overwhelmingly um, rejected by, by people in France. But because of the way the French constitution is, which I've learned a lot about, it's really much more into centralized authority of the executive branch than we have in the United States. And he, there are all these mechanisms that are part of the constitution that he can use so that he can avoid a vote of Congress and actually just kind of ram this thing through. And so it, it's basically a kind of know, brinksmanship is the right word. But he's like, if you, it's like the only way you can vote on this is if you agree to dissolve the government and everyone has to stand up for reelection again, except me. And that's that's like this mechanism. They <laughs> like if you care about this so much that all of you are going to run for reelection, but not me, then you get to vote on it. Um, so that's, see, there's a couple mechanisms like that that he used. And, and, Basically, there's been all this protest on two levels. One, people don't like the policy, but then secondly, they don't like the way he's doing it in this kind of essentially anti-democratic way he's doing it. And that's, that's the context for all these enormous protests right now. So what is really at stake here from an integral perspective? Yeah, well, um, you know, the machinations of the politics, I, I, I don't know. But what's happening in terms of the culture at large in the West, including France, is green. You know, is the, the, the postmodern progressive worldview, which used to be the cutting edge, even 20, 30 years ago, is now the, the mainstream, which is, first of all, it doesn't want to work in the way that orange wants to work. It's not achievement oriented. It wants to live well, but it wants a far more equal world. Egalitarianism is just key to, um, to, the, to the next move. So there's, there's an antipathy in, uh, this is all legitimate, I uh, think evolutionarily appropriate stuff. But the idea of there being super rich people and super poor people, that alone, is just not acceptable anymore. However, we have to fix that. that yeah. Has to yeah. And there's an, there's an interesting dimension of this, which is, you know, they want to raise, or Macron wants to raise the age of retirement from 62 to 64. But one of the things that my wife often says is, of the, you know, in this kind of class breakdown, of the poorest section of society, the people who are working, let's say, like factories or whatnot, some large number of them, I forget if it's, I don't know, maybe 25, 40%, some number of them never see their pension at all because they have the lowest life expectancy. Yeah. And so the idea of like universally raising the age of retirement really disproportionately affects people on who are like the lower side of that, that uh, equality gap, right? Income gap, which exactly, of course, Green is... Exactly what you're saying, right? Yeah. Totally Green is completely outraged by that. 
Yeah. And that's good. I'm sympathetic and, and basically in support of the fight forward in, the, in that there's something very powerful, uh, fundamentally powerful about capitalism and about the free markets and about the achievement orientation and about all of the jaw-dropping advances that orange brought to the system. Talk about poverty. We, we had equality of poverty <laughs> back before orange. I mean, there was always the aristocrats and the kings and the super rich in that way. But the great masses of people lived in poverty um, or sub, some sort of subsistence and chase for calories, basically. And modernity changed that. And so that's the that's that's the golden egg that the that capitalism and the free markets lay and, and, and bring to the party. And so people who have that um, worldview, they're very nervous about changing it and, and making work not pay off and making the safety net too soft and raising the bar, and what's the expense, and what's the cost? And of course, we have the socialist experiments of the first half of the 20th century that aren't so great. You know, the Soviet Union and China and, and communism didn't work, but that wasn't green communism. That was traditionalist communism. Yeah, That yeah. was communism implemented through a traditional good and evil kind of a system. So. You know, I think we're working our way to a, you know, a, a, what, what, there's a word, so somebody wrote a book on luxury communism or something like that. I'm forgetting the name of mm. it, but it's uh, a world where the bottom will be raised so that everybody gets to live a decent life relative to other people. And um, I think we're working our way towards that. And, um, and what's happening in France, I'll, I, I have friends who just arrived in Paris and it's a mess, you know, they said. And so I don't know how it's going to go in the short term, but um, the long term is that we will have, you know, I, I think we'll er eradicate poverty in ways that, I mean, we already have, you know, in terms of the abject poverty that's... Um, definitely on the trailing edge, but to provide a comfortable, more or less middle-class life for everybody, that's next. And so, you know, we're working our way to that. Mm. And so for me, the two kind of elephants in the room with us here, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's more of a horse thing, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and they're related is, you know, how AI is going to transform we're going to continue transforming yes. our work yes. and basic income. Yes. Yes. I used to be all for basic income and I still base, basically am for basic income. But I do get that there's something that is not healthy about just giving people money. You know, I mean, in, in terms of getting them out of abject poverty, giving them enough to eat, a roof over their head, that's, that's different. Just doing that is you know, for sure a good thing. But I don't know what, how humanity is going to evolve in this next stage when people don't, quote, have to work. I don't know. I mean, I think it'll be better ultimately, but you can see the problems of people without purpose. And, you know, they, we talk about this in integral theory, that when we move into integral, the basic motivation and integral onward, the basic motivation is we get up in the morning and we're just driven by our own creativity. Yeah. Yeah. That's, we're not there yet. For, uh, for humanity so far, we've been driven by fear. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, basic motivation of the first six stages of development. Yeah. It's fear motivation. There's something wrong. There's deficit. There's a deficiency. We have to fix it. And so that gets you off the couch because, you know, if you don't, you don't eat and you don't have anything. And that's been the motivation. And I'm not arguing for that. I worked all my life under those conditions and it's still, it's still fun. It's no, it's not great, but 
I'm now in the position where, you know, I'm retired and I don't have to worry about money and that sort of thing. It's hard to be motivated. You know, I mean, the, I saw I, the, humanity has a big job to do here in terms of figuring out how to um, get off the couch when you don't have to. Yeah. So then that makes sense to me. And of course, there's an internal side of that and an external side. And, you know, the external side, I could see it. I mean, your, your experience, which is not my experience because I'm younger and still feeling the pressure of like, fuck, I got to do something. Otherwise, I'm not going to you know, support my family. It, it's it's kind of like school. If we're, if we're always in these institutions that have these external pressures, then, it, then it's hard to have an endogenous desire, right? Because when you, you take the screws off and it's just like, dude, I just want to relax. Like my mom, single mom, worked every day of her life, always worked overtime, was always on call. The day she retired, I was like, oh, mom, you want to volunteer? You want to do this? When it's, she was like, no, like, I don't want to do anything. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. and, she, and she does it. You know, she really does it. And it's been years. And she's, I mean, she has this, what I would call uh, a really extended hangover from, really? from being in that system for so long. Yeah. And so it makes sense that That's externally- so great. What's that? I said, it's not so great. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No. So there's definitely external things we could do. And I think, I think the basic income, it would be, it'd be a, a, just a very different experience in terms of the external pressure. Yeah. But then what is the corresponding like internal leap that we well, have? Well, you, you said something that really opened my mind here. Um, and it's school. You know, I, maybe we rethink all of that because if you think of a kid, and I think of even myself, as a four-year-old, a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven, eight, 10, 12. I mean, I was always doing stuff because I wanted to. And, you know, fixing things and making things and my erector set and be down in the woods and whatever I, I didn't sit around on the couch. And, you know, maybe that's the nature of childhood, but maybe education actually, in a way, rings that out of us by having to sit down, shut up, and, you know, and, and imbibe the latest lesson. Oh, you for sure. You know, the whole, all of that changes, you know. So the humans of the future won't have had that run out of them. And the creativity that's natural as a child is nurtured. And, uh, you know, there's room for that expression because it, and it's not about going to some cubicle yeah. and sitting there all day and being part of a machine. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's actually, it's so, it's so funny to me. So I have a lot of friends who are in the alternative education world. They're like homeschooling their kids or alternative schools or whatever. And the names of these movements, just like the names of the parenting movements are always so funny. Like what, what would it be for parenting? It's, it's just like attachment parenting or lovely parenting. And they have all these names that are just so like, obviously like, well, yeah, wouldn't you want that? So there's this, there's this educational philosophy now called motivational learning, mm -hmm. where you follow what the child actually wants to do. <laughs> it's just like, just like, oh, yeah, how radical. <laughs> and it, and uh, it is totally radical in our society. But at the same time, it's like, oh, yeah, it's really clear that people learn a lot faster when they actually want to learn the things. Yes. No, and that sounds like, uh, and, and I know what you're talking about, this sort of different experiments and so forth, but they're right on schedule, you know, and there, there's a, you know, a thousand of them out there buying for, you know, what works, what doesn't this kid versus that kid, you know? Um, and I think it's exciting and, uh, that's their, uh, you know, plowing the way to the future. So hallelujah on that. But yeah, that's, that's, I think, We'll just have a different way of living. I mean, we'll be on this earth and we will have gotten war out of the way, hopefully, uh, which we largely have, you know, if you think of history. I mean, the president only looks uh, bad if you don't consider history, you know. Uh, so, you know, calories, uh, violence, uh, opportunity, education, all of that. Um, it's just we're we're living in a world of just proliferation 
of of that sort of thing, and we'll see how we work it out. But you know, it's never pretty, and it probably won't be this time either. You know, I was uh, reading some um, stuff on there's this talk about these educational movements. There's it, this um, thinking about education. I for, I'm forgetting the book, but uh, where experiments in third world countries where you give kids laptops and you give kids iPads and just naturally they educate themselves, you know, um, and uh, there's, I think, you know, I think kids absolutely want to educate themselves. They want to be, um, you know, creative and expressive and all of that stuff. And I think if we uh, notice and nurture that as these people are, that's good news for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just had this vision springing to my head as you're sharing that, that all of the, the human potential that is going to be, or is currently being unleashed and released by automation of so many of our tasks, which has been happening for decades, right? And is continuing and is accelerating. Like, like what if we just allocated all of that towards spending quality time with kids, you know, who, who in order to do this kind of more individualized motivational learning, you, you know, you can't have like one teacher with the same curriculum for 30 kids, right? It's not going to work because not everyone has the same motivation. So you, you could just have way more people involved. Yeah. Like yeah. One of the most important part of our species, the future, you know, and one of the most meaningful things you could do is like be in, be in relationship with the kids. It's totally. like a really nice. No, that could be what we pay attention to instead of work in the way that we've been thinking about it, particularly for the last few hundred years. And also care for each other and for old people and for people who need it, um, for homeless, you know, or whatever, the people who are not functional in the society as it is. Uh, you and I have talked about this before, is that one of the things that humanity is going to have to figure out is what do we do with people who are red? You know, how do they live their, how do they live a sparkling, happy life at Red? Where they, you know, they don't have a lot of ability to de delay gratification. They really don't want to fit into a system. They don't want to follow a clock. Uh, they want to be free in that sort of almost hunter-gatherer way, you know? And uh, so th that's, th that's, and, and yet I think in the sacred world to come, First of all, I think that'll be a lot more fluid. We could all spend our time there. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, people will sort of come and go, but that that has to be a territory that we're, we figure out that we haven't yet. I mean, what's happening is radical. And, it, and if you look at history, the, the changes that human beings have already been through have been one radical change after the next. That's not going to stop. We're not going to be able to predict it, you and I, any more than my grandparents could have predicted social media or anything that we're doing right now. They just, they wouldn't have had the capacity to, to even imagine it. So it's, that's also, that's going to keep happening. And if we're, um, you know, right about the, um, trajectory of, of humanity, it will be more good, true, and beautiful uh, than what we have now. And that's pretty exciting. And I don't know what the retirement age will be. <laughs> there won't be one. Yeah, I mean, that'd be my hope, right? Exactly. You know, I, it, I would have, people will be doing stuff in their 90s. Yeah, when, Retire, it's the opposite of purpose, as far as I'm concerned. Totally, yes. But, you know, I get your mother. I'm sort of like her. Okay, that's all for now. This is Jeff Salzman signing off. See you next time.